Well, today I have the great privilege of preaching for my friend, Pastor Ken DeChant at Journey Church in Fremont, Ohio. And unfortunately, I, I'm not able to be with you, but today you're gonna hear a great word from Pastor Jordan Moore. Pastor Jordan serves as our young adult pastor here at Calvary, and he's gonna be picking up in Matthew chapter nine in this Never the Same series and, and showing a story to us from the Gospels. And he's gonna help us see something from God's word that I think could be really helpful for some of us today. And so Pastor Jordan, thanks for bringing God's word. Calvary, would you give a great big welcome to Pastor Jordan Moore. All right. Thank you, wow, all right. Well, Calvary, it is such an honor and a privilege to be a part of what God is doing here and to uh, just stand in this place uh, for somebody who I have such great respect for as their, for their ability to communicate God's word and to do the same thing. And so, you know, it's with a heavy weight that I bring today's word, but I'm excited because I have loved this Never the Same sermon series uh, up until this point, and I'm just, I'm, I'm just really humbled and honored to be a part of, of this series. And so uh, today we are picking up in Matthew chapter 9. We'll be focusing in on verses 1 through 8 today, if you have your Bibles, and I will be using the uh, New Living Translation, the NLT, if you're following along in the Bible app. But uh, yeah, so, so have you guys had a good week? Anybody had a good week? Good. That's, that's a good response. Uh, it's been a very full week for my family. Uh, I feel like, you know, I, I, in, in life, people always ask you, like, how are you doing? You know, and I'm just kind of getting to the point where I'm tired of just saying, I'm oh, busy. You know, bu I'm busy, busy. But, but really, like, busy is a, a really accurate description uh, as to how my life has been lately. We have been just full steam into a, a renovation project. Any, any do-it-yourselfers or, you know, like, uh, home improvement guys or gals in the house today? Uh, a few, okay. The response was underwhelming, but maybe you're maybe you're out there. I saw a hand at least, but uh, I know some people here do it professionally, but. Uh, I like to try to to do as much as I humanly can myself, um, and so like you know, my wife will frequently I'll finish up a project and be like, ah, oh, that's it, no more, and then she'll hand me the list of what's next. Uh, but sometimes the list of things that we need to work on uh, they don't come because of you know like a, a desire to improve. Sometimes. It comes as a necessity. And so this last winter, if you remember, towards the end of December, we had a pretty bad cold snap that came through, and it froze a pipe inside of my bathroom shower. And when that pipe froze, it burst. Uh, I don't even know what it broke, but it broke the shower. And so uh, I we lost all functionality of our shower, but I was able to go in and, and to turn the water off so that, you know, we, you know, it wasn't going to cause a bunch of damage or flooding. Uh, and I got that done before, you know, it all thawed out. So we didn't actually ha have any water damage because we were able to catch it, but it has completely ruined our ability to use that shower. So I'm thankful for a Y membership so that my family, I'm just kidding, that's not what we did, but uh, <laughs> no, no, but, um, but anyway, you know, we, we, we were able to, to, to use our other restroom, but, um, but you know, we, we have been without a shower for a long time now, and uh, this project has taken a long time because, you know, I, I'm a do-it-yourselfer, but at the same time, I'm also a dad of three small kids, four coming in April, we're excited about that, uh, and you know, I, I work full-time, I've just got a lot of responsibilities. And so adding that thing is just, it's, some, it's just another thing. And so sometimes it's easy to push that to the back burner. Well, anyway, you know, I, I ripped out this whole shower and it's, it's kind of like, if you've ever tackled a project like this, you can start one place with like one idea in mind, but sometimes the more that you start ripping out and the more that you start removing and renovating, the bigger the project just keeps getting. And it's crazy how one thing can so easily spill over into the next thing and the next room and the next project. And so this has taken quite a while, uh, but we are near the end. But as I got this room completely stripped of everything, uh, all that we had hanging up was a few pieces of drywall that I didn't need to move, some studs, and uh, all the electrical wires. I was like, okay, it is finally time to start putting things back together now that we have everything demoed. 
And so I, I start looking at the electric and I'm like, okay, so I need, you know, this outlet is here, but I now need it to move over here. And I have this light switch and it's, it's on this wall, but I need it to go to that wall. And I just start looking at all of these electrical wires and I start to realize pretty quickly that I'm in over my head. Now, I, like, anybody an electrician in the room or good at electric? Okay, I'm good enough to be dangerous. And like, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm so good at it, it's shocking. You know, like I, uh, I frequently will accomplish what I'm setting out to do, but it's not without my wife running in, checking on me a few times because I just don't flip the breakers. Anyway, anyway, but um, so, you know, I, I just kept looking into this mess of wires within my walls. And the longer that I looked at it, the more confused that I became because it just wasn't making sense to me. And I, I know kind of what I needed to do and I just wasn't able to wrap my mind fully around it. And so time kept passing. I needed to get some stuff done. And so I was like, all right, it's just, you know, it's just time. I'm going to bite the bullet and I'm going to hire the professional. So I make a phone call. The professional comes rolling in and I describe the project to him. I'm like, okay, you know, this is here, but I need it to get over here. And I don't know what I'm doing there because all of this stuff is, is tied together. And I, am I going to overpower something? I just, it was too many questions that I didn't have the answer to. So I explained it to him. He's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. This will be simple. So I walk out of the bathroom. I'm like, all right, I'm going to let, you know, this man do what God has so divinely appointed him to do. And I cannot do, and I'm going to go handle some other things. And so a few hours later, I come back, assuming that this job would almost be done. And I find that, you know, what I thought that he was coming in to do, he hadn't even touched yet, but he had gone into every other wire that was in that bathroom, completely removed it and was running new wires. And I was a little bit confused and I'm like, wait a minute, man, like, like what, what's going on? Like, I thought that you understood that we were moving these things. Uh, why did you take everything out? And he had to just kind of like, he looked at me and, and really in a, in a kind and understanding way, he's like, look, Jordan, I know what you called me here to do and we're still going to do that. He's like, but when I started to look into this project, he said, you have wires running through your wall that were keeping your lights on and were functioning, but they have no business being in a house. Some of these wires were taken from an old aircraft and run through my walls. So like when everything is in, like in our, ba in our bathroom, it was working as far as we could tell. But he said, Jordan, I could not leave you the way that I found you because you were actually living with an incredible risk of fire. And so you, we had to get everything up to code just to do what you brought me out to do. And so I'm like, you know what? That's all I needed to hear. I want, you know, like in, in my job being a pastor, I, it's, it's our job. It's my calling to reach the least, the last, and the lost. But when I lay my head down at night, I want to make sure that I'm safe, sound, and secure. And so I don't want to have the risk of fire. And so, uh, you know, I, I let him do what he was supposed to do. And, and so now everything is a lot better. And in this beginning chapter of, of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, we see a familiar story in the Gospels of Jesus. And Jesus encounters a man who has a need. And what the man brings before Jesus is a significant need, and it's a need that needed to be addressed, but Jesus does something greater in that man's life than what he originally thought that he was asking God for. And so we're going to read, uh, we're going to read all eight verses here at the beginning, and then we'll continue to chew through it as time goes on. Uh, but verse one, this is what God's word says, Matthew chapter nine. Jesus climbed into the boat and went back across the lake to his own town. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, That's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up 
and went home. Fear swept through the crowd as they saw this happen, and they praised God for giving humans such authority. Now, I love this verse for so many reasons. For one, I love to contrast this verse with, other, uh, with the other areas in the Gospels where we see this. So we see this story here in Matthew chapter 9. But if you're to read the Gospels in their entirety, we also see this, this story, the same story presented in both the Gospels of Mark and Luke. So, you know, Matthew gives us a very concise telling of the story like we just read. But if you're to read in Mark and if you're to read in Luke, this same exact story, they give us some more colorful details that really help us to, if you're to read the story, they help us to paint a complete picture and almost kind of visualize exactly what was happening. And so as we go through this story, uh, please know that some of the details that we're going to talk about aren't necessarily found in Matthew chapter 9, but you can find them if you go and you read in Luke or in Mark. You can understand that these things are found in Scripture. So if you're a Bible nerd like me and you want to go home and do this later, Mark chapter 2 and Luke chapter 5, you will find the, this same story told. Uh, and so you can make note of that and read that. But um, so here uh, in, in the scripture, we have this, uh, this story of Jesus. And where in this sermon series where we last found Jesus, uh, he was in the region of Gadara, and he had just delivered the demon-possessed men and cast the demons into the pigs, and they run over the cliff. So if you were here for Pastor Chad's last message in this series, that's where we left off. And if you recall, the people in that village were freaked out by the whole thing, and they were like, okay, you know what, like, just go. Just, you just, you, I don't, we don't care where you go, but you've just got to get out of here. So they, they told Jesus, you know, hey, respectfully, please leave. And so Jesus got in the boat, and he left. And that's where our text picks up. Picks up. So, so we see verse 1, Jesus climbed into the boat and went back across the lake to his own town. You know, wherever Jesus would, would go throughout his earthly ministry, crowds would gather around him and they would want to hear his teaching. The sick would come to him for healing and the critics or the Pharisees uh, would also join in hoping to find fault in him or to make an accusation against him and bring him down. So here in this story, when Matthew's account starts off, Jesus was in the boat and he was headed for home. Uh, and, and I think this is an incredibly human thing for Jesus to do. I mean, like, think about it. Uh, close your eyes for a moment with me, if you would. And I just want, as your, as your eyes are closed, you just to begin to picture home. Now, this might not be the place you currently live, but it certainly might be. This is the place where you feel at perfect peace, where you feel loved, where you feel known and accepted. Maybe this is a childhood bedroom. Maybe this is a bench at a park. Maybe it's a kitchen or a dining room table. Maybe it's a living room with your favorite chair in it. What kinds of things do you notice around you? What decorations are on the walls? Is there anything in this place that you can smell? Is there anyone else in this place with you? You can open your eyes. Home is a powerful place. And so it's important, as we, and, and powerful also, to, as we read through the Gospels, we can see that Jesus was working incredibly hard to accomplish the task that God had set him out for. And yet, perhaps, in this moment, Jesus needed to rejuvenate. And some of the comforts of home was exactly what he needed to do that. Maybe in the physical, Jesus benefited from eating a home-cooked meal with those whom he loved. Maybe it did Jesus' soul well to rest in a bed that was familiar to him. Now, those details are not recorded in Scripture, but what we do know is simply that he left a difficult place where he was not wanted, and he went home. Jesus was not there long before word got out that he was back in the region and a crowd started to form around him in the house where Jesus was. The place quickly became packed with all sorts of people. 
what we can see in the text is that, you know, there were those who were there seeking Jesus for his teaching. We can also see that there were people there who loved Jesus and just wanted to be in his presence. We also know that some of the people that were there packing out that house that day, they were critical of Jesus. They didn't believe in him. They were looking to find fault in him. Others that were in the house that day were seeking Jesus for a miracle. Here's an important thought. Home, ideally, is a place where you find perfect peace. But who here pictured your current home exactly how it is? My guess would be that there is likely some significant difference between our ideal, picture-perfect home and the place you are currently calling home. The truth is, oftentimes, home is a place where we have a great deal of work to do. Verse 2 says this, Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. What a profound thing that Jesus does. But it's also curious. You see, Mark and Luke, they tell us more. They paint a clearer picture for us. Matthew gives us the facts. Mark and Luke give us some details. And through this, we see that there is this paralyzed man, and he has been brought before Jesus. But we also see an incredible act of desperation out of this man and his friends. You see, they, they brought their paralyzed man, they, or their friend, they carried him on this mat to the place where Jesus was, and they couldn't get inside. The crowd, there were too many people crowding this house. They couldn't make it in through the door. They had their friend, and they had this incredible need. They were desperate for Jesus to heal this man. They were desperate to see God move on his behalf. And so they stopped at nothing to get their need before the feet of Jesus. The way that houses were constructed in Capernaum uh, in those days, there was oftentimes steps that would lead outside of the house to the roof because the roofs were earthen. They were made from earth. So we're talking like thatched roofs and, and mud and different substances like that. And, and they needed a lot of care. So almost once a year, the, the people who lived in these houses would then have to reapply and roll layers of mud and earth and clay onto the tops of their roof so that their house could withstand the, the winter's elements. And so this was a very common thing. And so these men... They take their paralyzed friend on the mat and they get him to the roof and they began to dig. They dug a hole right in the roof of that house and they lowered their paralyzed friend directly to the spot where Jesus was standing. That's crazy, isn't it? Their desperation, their effort, their faith, they would not be denied getting their need before Jesus that day. And here we find Jesus with this incredible need presented before him. I, I do find it a little bit curious, and I'm not sure why Matthew didn't include the details as to why they dug through the roof that day. Perhaps, and just my own curiosity, my own curious mind, it could be that Matthew was the one that was assigned to fix the hole in the roof after this miracle took place. And frustrated by, you know, this uh, this this his own little, you know, uh, do-it-yourself project that he then had to take on. He's like, I'm going to leave that out of the records of history so that someday another disciple isn't fixing a hole in a roof by some desperate person. Uh, and, and think about it. Like, if, if that was the case in all situations, there might be people who show up to, to church one Sunday morning and the auditorium one is packed out, so they have to take a seat in auditorium two. And they're like, you know what? I will not be denied, Pastor Chad, in the flesh. I'm drilling a hole through the ceiling and I'm going to swing in like Indiana Jones and find a seat somewhere. I'm thankful that Matthew left that detail out because the important thing is, is not the fact that, uh, that, that they put a hole through the roof, but it's important to see their desperation for this miracle. Anyway, Matthew gets down to business and he just gives us the most important details in the story. There was a paralyzed man and, and see, there could be a combination of faith here. 
It could be that this man was paralyzed and he hears of Jesus and he begs these friends or these four people, well, please, I'll give you whatever, but please get me to Jesus. It could be that this man was in such a severe state that he had these people that loved him and said, by any means necessary, we are going to get you to Jesus. It could be the man's faith. It could be the faith of his friends, and it could be a combination of the two. But here in the text, we see Jesus saw their faith. These people needed a miracle and so believed that Jesus could do it that they stopped at nothing to get their need before them, before him. How often in our own lives do we need a miracle? And we think about Jesus, but for one reason or another, we stop at the door, so to speak. We never actually make it inside with our request for whatever reason. Maybe we feel like the space is too crowded. God has so many things that he's accomplishing around the world. Why would he care about me and this need? There are so many people who might, you might feel have more significant needs or hardship or, or, or circumstances than you do. And so why would God care about me and my position in life? Maybe we hold back from seeking the miraculous because of our faith. Or, or maybe it's a lack of our faith. Our lack of faith. We, we get to the door with our need. We see the crowd. It's, oh man. I could wait in line I could fight through the crowd and I might not even get my miracle anyway. Maybe we're just not desperate enough. Maybe we have the faith, but at the end of the day, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, we're comfortable in our life. We know that things could be better. We know that God could do greater things than what we're currently experiencing, but we just don't have the desperation to fight for that miracle. Possibly, we allow our past to hold us back from seeing our miracles and pursuing those things down. We can think to ourselves, do I even deserve this? You see, sometimes the things that we do in life, we, you know, we, we know that sin separates us from God. And sometimes because of choices that we've made or circumstances that we've lived through, we can just feel completely and utterly unworthy. God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. He's without sin, so why would he want to have any involvement with someone as unholy and unworthy as me. Maybe we just have a fear of stepping out and being healed. Maybe we're just like, you know, if I, I, I know I have this need, but if I go public with it, if I go public with seeking God for this miracle and it doesn't happen the way that I'm seeking, then what happens? Possibly, What's holding us back from our miracles is forgiveness or unforgiveness. For some in the crowd that day, their issue was a critical spirit and disbelief. I'm a big football fan. Anybody else? Okay, come on, somebody. I see that. But uh, I, I love football. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest, when I'm watching the game sometimes, part of what I like to do is, like, analyze what's going on. You know, I am, I am not a, a color commentator. You, like, there are people, some of you know way more about the sport than I will ever come close to knowing. But I love to, like, watch the play and to see how the athletes are lining up and to see who's in what position. And, you know, if you get familiar enough with it, you can even almost begin to predict what the play might be. Like, oh, I think in this formation, I think this is a run play. Or in this formation, I think this is going to be a pass. Or, you know, I, I think that the tight end, this is a good opportunity for the tight end to get the ball here. And if he does, he can get it. Like, I just love to watch that. I love to watch the offense. I love to watch the defense. And, and it's easy for me in my brain as I'm watching football just to be thinking to myself, like, run, 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 pass, pass, throw, throw, hurry, hurry, scramble. Like, you know, like, like hit him, hit him, hit him. Like that, uh, that Chargers fan on TV recently. Anyway, if you, if you know it, cool. If you don't, you don't. But, um, but there's, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes through my head. But one of the things that I've loved about um, Jesus, the football in recent years is they've started to do this thing where uh, the teams will pick a, a different player to mic up during the course of the games. So under their pads, they'll put a microphone. And so, you know, in my head, I'm analyzing the sport for what is going on in the game. But it's really kind of cool. After the game, you can get on there and listen to some of the mic'd up sessions. 
And hear what's actually going through through the, the minds of the athletes. Some of the situations that seemed super intense can sometimes actually be kind of funny based off of what these guys are saying. Uh, sometimes you can hear that some things that didn't look super intense actually were. Uh, and other times you hear things that you just wish you didn't hear. Like you just, uh, there, there's some of the stuff that's being said, it's like, why did they just say that? That's a penalty. And, and here we go. So, uh, so like, you know, here in the, in the, in the text, what's, what's happening? So we have Jesus and he forgives this man's sin. And then we get to peel back the layer and we kind of get to have the brains of those members of the crowd mic'd up, so to speak, because Jesus is able to like assess the situation. He's fully God, and he knows the hearts of the people in this room, and he calls out these critics. He calls out these men for their disbelief and the thoughts that they didn't even speak out loud. And so verses 3 through 4, this is what is said. But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you have such evil in your hearts? You see, the critics in the crowd just watched a small group of men take an incredible step of faith to present their need before Jesus. And rather than their hearts being in a posture to see the miracle taking place before them, they were blinded by their own cynicism. Some of the people in the crowd that day were hoping to hear Jesus teach out of genuine belief and love for him. Others were there to try to find out some sort of fault in Jesus or a reason not to believe. And others, again, were there to receive a miracle. These critics didn't have to say anything out loud. Jesus knew the condition of their hearts and the things that they were thinking without a single word being spoken. It's easy for us to read this story and to only look at the miracle that Jesus did for the paralyzed man that day. But here we see Jesus addressing the crowd and their disbelief. I believe that Jesus did this because although the miraculous healing that was, a, that was done that day had the greatest physical implications for the man on the mat, Jesus was doing the miracle for everyone there to believe, not just the man who received the physical healing. I need you to catch this. It's easy to seek Jesus for what we want him to do for us, but we cannot neglect what Jesus might want to accomplish through us. Sometimes there is more at play in your life than just the physical things you see around you. The voids, the hurts, the needs. Jesus is almost always doing more than what we can see in the natural. So here Jesus makes this statement. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk. You see, Jesus exposed to everyone there that the man on the mat was far from the only paralyzed person in the room. The setting for this story is essentially a great example of a New Testament church. We have a crowd, all present for the purpose of Jesus. And there's preaching, the best preacher. They get Jesus in the flesh. Sorry, you don't have that today. You just give me. Uh, there were people in the crowd uh, who knew the law and who knew of Jesus, but didn't really know Jesus. They knew all about their religion, but they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And here Jesus exposes this fact. You see, it was obvious to everyone that there was a paralyzed man in the middle of the room. In the natural, everybody could see this man and could identify his physical need. But he might have been, speaking of this paralyzed man, he might have been the only person in the room that day that understood or that knew that he was paralyzed. Less obvious is the fact that the faith of many in the room, like he, they, their faith of, of many of the people there in the room that day, it had a body 
but it didn't have legs to support itself. Some of their faith had arms, but they were immobilized and unable to reach out and to do real work. I know this story takes place a long time ago in history, but for some people today, this is your story. You are here. You know how to talk. You know what to say. You know how to act. But in your heart, you don't have Jesus. In reality, you are spiritually paralyzed. Jesus is getting to the real issue at hand here. The man on the mat was not desperate for forgiveness. The man on the mat was desperate for healing. It is equally as easy for Jesus to heal as it is for him to forgive. That's the truth. Jesus, with his unlimited power and ability, can heal somebody just as easily as he can forgive somebody. It is easy and common for us to seek God for his physical gifts or to fulfill our needs and desires, but asking for forgiveness and admitting our wrongs, that's difficult. Jesus did the most important miracle first. Jesus prioritizes us being in right standing before God. The man and the crowd both prioritize the physical ability to stand. Jesus, like everyone in the crowded room, could see the man physically paralyzed. But unlike anyone else, Jesus saw his spiritual paralysis. Often in this life, we need to start seeing past ourselves. The Pharisees and the skeptics needed to see past their own doubt. The man on the mat needed to see past his physical limitations. Suffering in this life is a difficult topic to understand, especially whenever we address suffering in context with God. How could a God with limitless power and ability and love and grace and compassion allow me, allow good people to suffer in this life? That is a huge question, and we don't have time to fully unpack it today. I'll meet with you if you want. But I want to help you gain some perspective on this challenging issue. How can this all-powerful God allow our lives to feel so broken at times? First thing I want you to know on this topic is that God's purpose for you is not restricted to this life, but it spills over beyond the grave into eternal life. When God asks his children to bear horrible suffering in this life. It is only with the prospect of heavenly joy beyond all human comprehension. We can learn a lot about suffering through the Apostle Paul. If you were to open your Bibles and to read it from beginning to end, there's no shortage of people in Scripture who suffered. It's common for God's people to face difficulty and difficult seasons and pain and suffering in their lives. Suffering is not a new topic to Christians, but it's a challenging topic for us as Christians today. Paul, in the New Testament, with the exception of Jesus, is possibly the one person who suffered to the greatest extent. And we can learn a lot from him on this. For example, Paul was whipped five different times with a three- uh, uh, three-ended whip, um, and each time he received 26 lashes to the back and 13 to the chest. He was stripped and beaten three different times with wooden rods by Roman authorities. He was surrounded and stoned by a mob of people in Lystra, who then drug his body outside the city and left him for dead. Could you imagine being surrounded and having people hurl rocks at your body? 
as the pain continued on throughout his body, I just can't help but imagine that Paul was just hoping that one of those rocks would connect with his temple and knock him unconscious so that he wouldn't have to feel the pain and the suffering that was being inflicted upon him. Paul was in prison frequently for long periods of time in Roman jails. Those jails had unspeakable conditions. They didn't have temperature control. They didn't have sanitation. His hands and his feet were bound in shackles. Paul suffered natural disasters. He was no stranger to debilitating illness. Paul was shipwrecked three different times. One time when he was shipwrecked, he was floating out at sea for a day and a night. Paul had enemies that sought to end his life almost everywhere he went. Paul worked long hours, often without sleep, frequently without food, and without adequate protection from the elements. Psychologically, Paul bore a great deal of anxiety for the new Christian churches that he planted and would seem to be in constant trouble, whether it be threat from other people with violence or threat from just bad theology. Paul bore the anxiety for those churches that he would start. You see, in this life, in context of suffering and balancing suffering and evil with Scripture, we need to learn to see things differently. This verse is Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. He makes this amazing statement about the sovereignty of God and suffering. He teaches us how through seeing things correctly, how how God sees them, not how we see them. We can make it through these difficult times. The Bible says this, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. It is interesting in this popular verse, Paul uses two different words pertaining to the word see. The first word that we come across is the Greek word skopeo. And it basically means to gaze intently or to focus on something. This is where we get the modern word scope. So think in terms of like a telescope or a microscope or or maybe it's even like a hunting scope of some sort. But essentially the scopeo is the ability to hone in and to focus on things that from the natural eye would not have been able to be seen. The second word is this word blepo. And this is the ordinary Greek word for vision. Uh, You can see me down here with your natural eye. Maybe you need glasses, otherwise I'd be a little fuzzy. But from the natural, blepo, we can pull out our phones and we can see a message. Sometimes there might be unseen meaning behind some of the messages that we read on our phones from others that we get. And that would be the unseen, that scopeo. Think about it like this. Surprise, uh, or suppose that somebody uh, is, that you love sits down and just allows you to unpack a challenging season that you're walking through. In the natural, you explain these details of your life, the stresses and the struggles to them. And then supernaturally, they say something to you that is exactly what you needed to hear. You were explaining something with natural sight. You were explaining the details as you saw them, but they responded with supernatural sight in a word from God. We need to pray that God gives us supernatural vision to see what he is doing through the events of our life so that we can make the right responses to the events and grow from what we are going through. What in your life Could Jesus be trying to help you get past? Verses 6 and 7 say, I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up and went home. I need everybody to see this. 
Jesus did the miracle of healing after revealing who he was to the crowd, addressing the most critical issue in that man's life first. Was this man's physical condition important to Jesus? Yes, it was. Is it God's will that this man suffer and live his life confined to a mat, unable to move or care for himself or provide for himself? No, it was not God's will for this man. Did Jesus know in that moment that he would someday soon be laying his life down physically out of love for this man on the mat? Yes, he did. I really need you to hear me on this. Jesus did not die on the cross so that we could have a good life. Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross so that we could have abundant life, so that we could have life eternal. You see, Jesus knew in that moment that he was about to tell this man to get up, to take up his mat, to be healed, and to walk. He knew that he was going to do a miracle on behalf of that man, but he also knew that someday that man would need to get back on the mat, that someday that man's life on this side of eternity would come to an end. And so the most important thing that Jesus needed to do that day was not the physical healing that the man came seeking. It was the supernatural act of forgiveness that allowed this man to have life greater than he ever knew before this point. That he had life that would not end when his lungs stopped breathing and his heart stopped pulsating. It was not God who made this man paralyzed. Suffering and sickness do not come from God. However, God can use our suffering and use our story for his greater purpose. In our text, we see a perfect example of this with Jesus using the life of this paralyzed man who was first transformed on the inside to build and establish the faith of others, even the faith of the critics. I do not believe this is insignificant that Jesus finished off this encounter by instructing this now healed man to stand up, pick up his mat, and to go home. Taking the mat with him could lead to the fact that it was no longer something needed in his freshly healed body. Yes, but it is also a sign to everyone that he would walk by on his way home that his past did not define His future. He now carries the mat that he was carried on in the past as a sign of God's grace to everyone that he would walk past. Does anybody in this room have a past? You see, sometimes God wants to use the things that you have been through to be an example and a demonstration of his goodness and his power and his love and his grace and his forgiveness to everyone you walk past. You might have a past, you might have scars, and those scars might not go away on this side of eternity, but God can use our scars, he can use our situations, and he can use our story, not just so that we can leave changed but so that all may know his goodness and his grace. What this man now carries is what he was once confined to. I believe that some of you here today, it might feel like God is speaking directly at you. Some of you walked into this church and spiritually, you are completely paralyzed. Some of us today have come in here and your life Maybe it's your home. Has a lot of work that needs done to it. Some projects, if we were to walk into your spiritual home, might be obvious and anybody could point them out. Others might be some issues under the surface. There might be some wires 
that are in the wrong location. And although the lights turn on, you might be living at an incredible risk of fire. If that's you that I'm talking to today, please don't worry. There's hope. And there's hope for your house. Jesus demonstrated for us that he can miraculously make that which is paralyzed walk again. We even know that Jesus can breathe life into that which is dead, buried, and stinking, like he did in the case of his friend Lazarus. Do you need a miracle in your life today? Whether it be physical, whether it be relational, whether it be spiritual, I believe that God can, and I believe that he will, but it all starts with forgiveness. Forgiveness makes way for the miraculous. Verse 8 says, Fear swept through the crowd as they saw this happen, and they praised God for giving humans such authority. When we see God moving in miraculous ways, we cannot forget that God gets the glory for this. God did the healing. God did the miracle. Let's not confuse it here. God has not given us the authority or the ability to forgive all sins. That is a right and a role reserved for Jesus and Jesus alone. These people were amazed that God had given this power and authority to a man. And that man who had the ability to forgive sin and to back up his forgiveness of sin with a physical act of healing must be the Messiah, must be the one that was foretold to them. However, God has given us the ability and the authority to forgive one another. And the lack of forgiveness in your life could be the barrier between you and your miracle. Forgiveness, uh, miracles follow forgiveness in your life today. Who might you need to forgive? Maybe there's somebody in this room today that you need to forgive. Maybe there's somebody that you will go home to that you need to forgive. Maybe there's a family member that you have not seen in a long time because of what they have done and the hurt that they have caused you. And you have allowed that hurt to cause you to harbor unforgiveness and become the paralyzed person on the mat. A friend of mine often says that unforgiveness is like drinking rat poison and hoping that the other person dies. It might be that you need to forgive somebody. It also might be that you need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe we're dealing with a person. Maybe we're dealing with God. Do you want to see miracles in your life? Do you want to see a miracle in your home, in your body? Forgive. Miracles follow forgiveness. But also, forgiveness itself is a miracle. Think back with me to the cross. When Jesus is being crucified, he's betrayed, he's hanging brutally beaten, blood is pouring out of his body. As he's there on the cross, suffering to the greatest extent, there's three statements recorded in, Jesus, in Scripture that Jesus made on the cross. Jesus' final three statements that he would make on this side of eternity, on that side of his mission. The first statement that Jesus makes while he's hanging on the cross, Father, forgive them. He's offering forgiveness to those who hurt him, to those who beat him, to those who were taking his life from him. 
to those who spit in his face and mocked him. Jesus is forgiving them in that moment. The next statement that we have recorded from Jesus is to the thief on the cross. This was a man who from our knowledge did nothing right up until the very last breath that he took. And Jesus makes a statement to him when this man acknowledges that surely there must be something about Jesus worth following and submitting to. Jesus makes this statement to that man. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Forgiveness is offered to those who don't deserve it. And then with Jesus' last statement, he surrenders his life to God. Forgiveness is a miracle. And miracles follow forgiveness. When Jesus laid down his life on the cross, There has never been and there never will be a greater miracle than what he did that day. With the shedding of his blood and the laying down of his life, Jesus atoned for the sins of all mankind. He made a way for all to be made whole and for heaven to be our home. Here's the pattern that we see in scripture through this story. There's four words that you can remember. Faith, forgiveness, freedom, and faithfulness. Faith. The man and his friends had faith that Jesus could heal. Forgiveness. Before the man and the crowd could see the physical healing, Jesus prioritized the most important thing. Forgiveness freedom, the spiritual freedom that this man experienced on the inside was now on full display on the outside. Faithfulness. The man walked away in faithful obedience, carrying the mat he no longer was confined to as a sign to everyone what God had done. Today, in one way or another, you might view yourself as the man on the mat. You might feel like you are desperate and in need for a miracle. Today, you might realize that that miracle that you need in this life is forgiveness from your sins. We began this service today by celebrating lives transformed, by celebrating and rejoicing with people who have said yes to Jesus, have accepted it in their heart and decided to follow him. And today, we might conclude the service by people here in this place making that same commitment to follow Jesus. Today might be the day where you go from being a critic to being forgiven and being committed to Jesus. Today might be the day where that situation that you've been dealing with, that's been covered up, that's been just a sore in your side, that has had you spiritually paralyzed for so long, you allow finally forgiveness to invade that situation and restoration to take place, healing to abound between you and that person, between you and that thing, whatever it might be. The miraculous follows freedom. One final thought about the man on the mat. You know, I know in formal communication, you're not supposed to introduce new information in your conclusion. But today we're breaking the mold a little bit. The man on the mat, in those days, if you were paralyzed, society at large considered you to be close to death. There wasn't a lot that they could do to care for people who were paralyzed. And there wasn't a lot that paralyzed people could do to contribute to society. So that mat that that man was on that day symbolized that he was close to death. Today, that might be exactly how you feel. You might feel like your life, your situation, your circumstances, are just so close to death. 
but I want you to understand that we are in the presence of a holy God. And where forgiveness is present, miracles abound. Today in God's presence, I believe that he can take your situation that might feel like a death sentence, that might feel like a grave and breathe life into that. Today, the team, we're gonna conclude by singing that song again, Graves into Gardens. And I believe that that might be exactly what God is gonna do in your life today. If today you need to make Jesus your Lord and Savior for the first time, maybe you invited God, you became a Christian long ago, but you have been walking around so spiritually paralyzed that your relationship with God is in a point of being completely non-existent then as this song sings, would you seek God's face? Would you ask for his forgiveness? Would you invite him into your heart and into your life and make him Lord again? Maybe there's a miracle that you are desperate for and you are dead without it. Allow forgiveness to reign in this place and let's see God do what only he can do. Father God, we thank you for your love and your compassion and your forgiveness. And God, I thank you for the miracles that you are doing even now in this moment. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that it is still alive and transforming. God, I thank you for your church. We thank you for your people. And God, I pray that you allow us to use our past, to use our stories, to use our pain, and to use the miraculous things that you do through us to impact the world around us. That's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.